Hi folks, we're just giving a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let everybody in before we get started with tonight's event. If you are already in tonight's webinar with us, uh, you can open up your chat window and find some information about how to purchase books by tonight's featured authors. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Eve Gleichman and Laura Blackett presenting their new book, The Very Nice Box. They'll be talking with Joshua Hinkins, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Eve, Laura, Joshua, and the team at Mariner Books for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the authors, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in a later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Very Nice Box, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase even Laura's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop that by link in the chat. Even Laura stopped by our store to sign copies of the book so you can get a signed book by request while supplies last. Make sure to indicate your signed copy request in order comments at checkout when ordering online or look for signed copies when you visit the store. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Joshua Hinkin. He is the author of the novel Swimming Across the Hudson, a Los Angeles Times notable book, Matrimony, a New York Times notable book, and The World Without You, winner of the 2012 Edward Lewis Wallant Award for Jewish American Fiction and a finalist for the 2012 National Jewish Book Award. His most recent novel is Morningside Heights. His short stories have been published widely, cited for distinction in Best American Short Stories and broadcast on NPR's Selected Shorts. He lives in Brooklyn and directs the MFA program in fiction writing at Brooklyn College. He'll be speaking with our featured authors, Eve Gleichman and Laura Blackett. Eve Gleichman's short stories have appeared in the Kenyon Review, the Harvard Review, Bomb, Daily, and elsewhere. Eve is a graduate of Brooklyn College's Fiction MFA program and lives in Brooklyn. Laura Blackett is a woodworker and writer based in Brooklyn. Their new book, The Very Nice Fox, is an offbeat, wryly funny debut novel that follows an eccentric product engineer who works for a hip furniture company where sweeping corporate change lands her under the purview of a startlingly, startlingly charismatic boss who seems determined to get close to her at all costs. 
The book has been praised by such celebrated writers as Jamie Attenberg, Melissa Fabos, Emily Gold, Kristen Arnett, Hilary Leichter, and Helen Phillips, who says, a satire of contemporary corporate culture, an exploration of how vulnerable we become in grief, a surprising romance, a cautionary tale. Somehow, the very nice box manages to be all of the above. Eve Gleichman and Laura Blackett have a wicked sense of humor and a keen view on our current moment. This is a delightful and propulsive read. Eve and Laura are going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then they'll be talking with Joshua and with all of you. Eve and Laura, please take it away. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, we're so happy to be here. We love Greenlight Books. Thank you so much to Greenlight and to, to Joshua. Um, Greenlight is my local bookstore, so this is a really especially um, special night for me. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, we're going to read um, from not the very beginning of the book, but the second chapter. Um, uh, and do we need to provide any context? Sure. I mean, I guess like for, for those of you who don't know what The Very Nice Box is about, it's kind of like a suspenseful take on an opposites attract romantic comedy between a walled off queer woman and a tech bro. Um, so Ava Simon, who's our protagonist, who's a very kind of reserved, regimented person, um, works uh, for a company that's becoming kind of like a flashier and flashier uh, contemporary tech office space. And so in this chapter, um, she's being called into a sort of last minute surprise meeting, which to her, she's really she's really dreading and she's not sure uh, what the meeting's about and what's going to happen there. That was really good. <laughs> okay. Um... Since Stada's expansion, Ava hadn't seen much of her boss, Carl, but now here he was in the conference room, setting out wedges of cake and useful utensils. The last few years had worked on his appearance. When he'd recruited her many years before, when the company was made of a half dozen woodworkers, Carl had been strapping and bright eyed. Now his tall, thin frame slumped. His shoulders were rounded, his mop of blonde hair had begun to thin. Behind him, the word imagine was projected onto the wall in Stada's signature sans serif font, the letters dissipating and gathering again in a flashy loop of transition effects. Ava wasn't surprised that she hadn't noticed this particular addition until now. The rebranding of the company was occurring constantly all around her at a dizzying speed. She would be unfazed to return to her desk to find that her encouraging desk chair had been replaced with a large rubber ball. Ava liked Carl. He wasn't shy, but he was quiet. His voice was flat and gentle and higher than one might expect from a man of his height. When he spoke in front of an audience, his calm energy blanketed the room. His public speaking style was the opposite of what Stada's powerful presentation training recommended now, which was to strive for the vocal equivalent of light pyrotechnics. But Ava found him incredibly pleasing to listen to. This was in part because of his dry humor, which he served with a tight, playful smile, and in part because of his Nordic accent, which placed emphasis on unexpected syllables, building a cadence that was quietly riveting. He stood at the head of the room as Ava's colleagues, there were dozens now, milled around the edges. The walls were flanked with half erased notes from the manager training that had taken place before the party. Key takeaways, be aware of defensive pessimism, climb the ladder of perception, practice radical compassion. Am I in a cult? Ava wondered vaguely. She had been through a few of these trainings herself over the past several months. They were part of Stada's expansion, and although they weren't required, she wondered whether her attendance or lack of attendance was noticed. Once after dodging three consecutive self-care seminars, she had been notified by an email from Spirit that she was quote unquote missed, and she was provided with a link to view the workshop virtually. The personality test, a day-long workshop to determine your leadership color, was especially popular. It was Stada's version of the Myers-Briggs test. 
You could be assigned red, yellow, green, or blue based on whether you were naturally direct, outgoing, empathetic, or analytical. Ava's colleagues had been excited to find out their colors. Some employees included their color in their email signatures. Others bought color-coded knickknacks for their desks or wore clothing and accessories that corresponded to their colors. Floor 7 had been re recently converted to the swag lounge where a limitless variety of colorware was available. Ava had taken the test at the request of the spirit team after avoiding it for months. The questions had been bewildering, but the results were predictable, blue, analytical. She could have told anyone that without a test, but she wondered if an earlier version of herself might have been assigned green, empathetic, and part of her was disappointed by the result. The results packet she received after taking the test included a series of backhanded compliments. You compensate for your social deficit by demonstrating a raw talent with numbers. Although your colleagues do not enjoy your company, they trust your work. Your time management skills surpass and therefore irritate those around you. If there was one thing Ava liked about the personality test, it was that it made small talk easier. She understood that every conversation was a different configuration of the same components. The personality test made it easier to find common ground and in turn allowed her to make jokes where one would otherwise be difficult to muster. Some mornings in the wellness kitchen, she could get away with simply saying, oh, I can see your red is showing as someone reached for the coffee first. Carl tapped the side of his festive plastic plate with a useful fork. All right, everyone, if I could have your attention. The din settled and everyone turned to face him. For a moment, he didn't appear to have anything else to say and Ava felt a light panic on his behalf. We're here in part, he continued, to celebrate Ava Simon. It's her 10 year anniversary today with Stada. Ava, please join me. A man from the spirit team hit a button and a blast of electronic music erupted from the room's speakers. Ava's stomach was a hard pit. She tried to make herself small. She hadn't realized it was the exact date of her 10 year anniversary at Stada. Maybe if she didn't look up at Carl, at anyone, this could be over quickly, but no, she could not disappear. She walked to the front of the room, awkwardly maneuvering around the sturdy tables where the music blasted. She stood next to Carl and faced her colleagues with a closed smile. She thought of a screwdriver fitting into the head of a screw and turning slowly. The spirit staff were fumbled with the button and the music stopped. Carl leaned in to whisper to her, I just like this sort of thing too. It will be over shortly. So, hi guys. Um, <laughs> so I feel like, I mean, I, Laura, I've never met you before, but but I'm really happy to meet you. Um, nice to meet you, Eve, you. Thank you. Um, so Eve, Eve was a student of mine uh, at the MFA program at Brooklyn College, and I see we have a bunch of MFA graduates uh, in the chat. And so I just want to start off by saying how thrilled I am for you two to have written such a great book. And really, you know, in your case, Eve, since I know you, I'm really, really proud. Um, and um, also because we have a bunch of writers in this discussion, um, the kind of questions I, I may ask may be more writerly than typical. And if you want to move away from those kind of questions, we can, we can become less writerly. But I guess I just want to start off with a, a, a version of a question that I'm sure you've gotten before, but that I as a writer, and I'm sure other writers on this screen must be thinking about, which is that the process of co-writing a book. I mean, I have trouble writing a book with myself. And I mean, I, I don't mean simply because I have trouble living with myself, but that, that might be true. But I just mean simply like, I can't agree with what I thought yesterday and I'm one person. And so I'm just wondering, yeah, like what did you, how did this come about? Um, what were the challenges of writing collectively? What were the pleasures? What were the difficulties? You know, the, the good, the bad, et cetera. I'd love to get a sense of that process. <laughs> In terms of the conception of the book. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like that story sort of starts almost 10 years ago. Even I uh, met because we moved into the same apartment building at the same time um, and, you know, met each other as neighbors and then became kind of fast friends and started trading dinners off in the building and getting to know each other that way. Um, and I, one thing that Eve said during a different interview that we had that I loved was that like they see this sort of dinner sharing as one of our earliest forms of collaboration. Um, and over the years, we've kind of we've collaborated on some other types of projects like I've helped Eve build some furniture for their apartment and things like that. Um, and so I think it's generous to call that a collaboration. <laughs> I mean, I I think so, but um, yeah. And so we sort of like, we had already been getting to know each other, I think in a very sort of 
collaborative sense. Um, and yeah, I mean, when I look back, I feel like the things that we were connecting over ended up becoming sort of like a fertile ground for this for this project. And I I don't remember like the exact moment that the idea to write this came up, but I just remember being open to it. Um, I, I I knew that you were somebody who who um, once you started a project did not leave it hanging. And I feel like I'm that kind of person too. And so I, I knew that if we tried it, we would finish it. If we started it, we would finish it. And I kind of had a um, gut feeling that it would be at least a positive experience, even if the end product didn't work. Like I, you know, the very worst thing that could happen was that we wrote a book together from start to finish and nothing happened with it. Um, but I just, I knew we would finish it. And I think that's um, more than I could say for myself if I had just tried to write a novel myself, um, because I had tried um, and not and it started a few novels and not finished, not finished them. And so um, I found it easier to write with Laura than I than I in general I find it to write with myself. Um, I think it's easier to agree with somebody else than to agree with yourself. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I find it easier to negotiate with somebody else than to negotiate with yourself. I Yeah. And I think moments where, so I guess like just sort of mechanically speaking, um, the way we, the way we wrote the first draft at least was that we would, we would each write a chapter and pass it back and forth and alternate. Um, and at this point it's been revised and, and sort of, under it's sort of it's had so much surgery that it doesn't that doesn't hold up anymore exactly um but in moments where we felt like we had to take go in a different direction or like say no there's there was always sort of another idea or an alternative waiting for us and I think that when you disagree with yourself it's a lot harder to come up with alternatives um but I don't remember us saying sort of like butting heads or really saying no all that much it was it was very much like um, yes, or let's try three other things and see which one's the best. Um, yeah, I, and I think that Laura in particular is a very good problem solver. So anytime that um, we hit a problem with plot or character, it, I, I wasn't just turning into myself for answers. Um, and it's really nice to have a friend when you have a problem, whether it's a <laughs> fictional problem or a, real a problem that problem. you created or yeah. not. <laughs> Um, so I, I actually found, I, I don't know, like the, uh, I've heard a lot from writers about how they could never do this themselves or how it must've been really hard to negotiate and how there must've been drama or these fraught moments, but really, um, I found it a relief to have a writing partner. You know, that, that makes sense. And I think, I mean, there are a lot of remarkable things about the book. And one of, one of the remarkable things is that it, it feels like it was written by one person as opposed to two people, by which I mean, that the voice was consistent. And so I guess, yeah, one thing I'm, I'm interested in is not like whether there, I, yeah, I don't really care whether there's drama or not. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, more like, you know, I'm just finding it really interesting, Laura, that you say that, you know, you each took a chapter. Um, how did you guys make it so that the voice, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just remembering now that at my house at, at dinner at the end of the semester, Eve, I believe you were the person in the, in the craft class. There was a little experiment where you wrote a sentence from you yeah. wrote a sentence from everyone's we had to guess who wrote the sentence and you tried to write the same sentence from different people in the class's voice do you remember this Steve yeah yeah so I'm just curious how you like how you guys were able to make the, I mean voice is such a, a distinct and important part of fiction and were you guys editing each other's work? Yeah, to make I mean, I think first, I, I think we're both very accommodating and very observant. And, and so if I saw something that Laura was doing in a chapter, I would try to sort of repeat that thing in another chapter so that it felt like one voice. But also we were both sort of sanding the novel down at all times. So if Laura was working on a new chapter, I was in the old chapters making sure everything felt like the same voice, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, making sure that meta that the metaphors felt like they were, they were all, um, I don't know, I guess, written by the same person, like the, that are, that any, any seams in this fabric were sort of um, erased. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we were both, we were both always at work at that. And maybe that I was more of the fine, like the sandpaper with the finer grit. Yeah, the finer grit. And Laura was moving bigger parts around. Yeah. Also, I think that just as friends, like even I sh really share a sense of humor and um, like a tendency towards close observation. So I think that like our, our similarities as, as friends really helped us with this. Um, but also like my, in my day job, I'm, I work, I'm a technical writer and I work on a team, on a team with like 10 other writers and we have to all kind of find a unified voice there too. So I have some kind of like vocational practice with that also. Um, so I think that we both, we were, yeah, we were both kind of um, coming in and, and making, you know, trying to like uh, sand things down. Another thing that comes to mind is just that we would be texting each other constantly with ideas. And so sometimes, you know, Laura would text me an idea and I would work it into the chapter that I was writing. And so it was really Laura's brain in my chapter. <laughs> and I think the opposite happened too. So yeah, there was a mind meld. Right, right. I feel like we were, we were, I, that's really interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about sort of like the ideas that we share with each other while the other person, it's like their turn to write. Um, right. But yeah, I feel like we were both kind of constantly writing and constantly editing. And it was like, never really, nothing was very still about it for very long. Um, yeah, I, I was gonna say one other thing, but I can't remember, but left my brain. I, I don't think there's a single sentence in the book that both of us did not have our hands. Yes, on. this is what I was gonna say. Something that I think a lot about is like, it just over the course of revision, like if, you know, if Eve writes a sentence and then I revise the sentence and then Eve, Eve revises the sentence, like at what point, like who, you know, who wrote the sentence? And um, that's, that's a question that I ask myself a lot. Um, that makes sense, that feels like a credit to you both in various ways. I mean, tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about this idea of ideas that you bandied back and forth. Uh, you know, how much of the book did you map out in advance? Because it's a very carefully plotted book. And, um, well, I don't want to spoil it for people who, who haven't read it, but certainly when you get to the, when you get to the closing bunch of pages of the book, um, you see how careful the narrative is. And I'm wondering, yeah, how much you knew in advance? How much, are you guys mappers out or not mappers out? Um, we're medium mappers outers. I mean, we, we would map out three chapters ahead. We certainly didn't know the end of the book before we, you know, we, we didn't map, we didn't outline the whole book ahead of time, for instance. Um, and there were certain twists in the book that took us by surprise too. Um, that we're not allowed to talk about here, but yeah. that, you know, but that we sort of realized, you know, late. Um, it's hard to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm trying to find my way around it. Um, but yeah, we would, we would have dinner every couple of weeks and map out like three to five chapters in advance and kind of like invariably we would stray from our outline and um, new ideas would come up just sort of off the cuff that seemed like fun and useful for the particular chapter that we were writing. And then I think that this is kind of where Eve's craftsmanship really comes in. Like, I think I was sort of throwing a lot of spaghetti at the wall and Eve was like, we're gonna make sure we use every single piece of this in a nice meal. Um, so like there were certain <laughs> characters and ideas that came up, like uh, for instance, um, Shrink, the Shrink app was just, Kind of a funny idea that that one of us brought up in one chapter that we decided to develop and and like make a pretty pretty important part of the novel yeah i mean we were very or i was very obsessed with making sure there were we we started referring to these as hangnails anytime there was a detail that was left you know unattended to later i guess an orphan detail <laughs> but like just making sure that we we made use of every everything that populated those early chapters, even if we didn't know what they were there for initially. So it felt, I think it felt really plotted and careful, but it, I don't, I don't actually think it, what the process, we did, we didn't have that tight of a grip on the, on the plot or, or, you know, we weren't that advanced. Yeah. <laughs> I think it wasn't until we started on the second half that we really, that things really started to like come together. That makes sense. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Helen's blurb, and because I, I think one of the interesting things about the book is that it, it's kind of many things at once. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a send up of a certain kind of corporate culture. 
it's a romance and a play on, as you, you guys said, on romantic comedy. It's also a book about grief. And the book's very good at, um, at having a number of different registers that it alternates between that also that it you know embraces at the same time. And I'm wondering, was that a struggle for you guys at all in terms of like, what kind of book <laughs> is? And or if it was, so maybe that was, or if it wasn't a struggle, what like for the writers among us, like what were the, what were the aesthetic struggles? What, what, were the, what were the hardest things along the way in getting the book to the place where you wanted it to be? Well, we, we didn't, we didn't um, set out to write any of those things. We, didn't, we weren't trying to write a satire. We were not trying to write a romantic comedy. I think, you know, in its original conception, we were trying to write a suspense. You know, we just, and it was, you know, we thought we were writing a really straightforward suspense, but we, but we started with Ava and we didn't know anything about her except for the way that she behaved. So we, we knew that she um, was very regimented and we knew that she divided her days up into these 30 minute units. And we knew that she just could not tolerate any of these sort of like gimmicky things that were happening at work. Um, and once we started to ask ourselves why she, she was this way, I think the rest of the book started to fall into place. Like, oh, well, she's, she's been through something and like, you know, people aren't ordinarily like this. So like what happened yeah. to her? Um, and also who can we put her with? Like what, what, what kind of character can we put her in a room with that will create some, some kind of drama? Um, and where can we place her that will be, that will, I don't know, like bring some life to, to or that, that will, um, prompt change in her. Um, and so I think those decisions of like putting Matt Putnam in a room with her or putting her at Stata created the romantic comedy and then also created some of the satire um, yeah. that was layered on top of the suspense that we had initially conceived of. Yeah, and I think like before we before we sort of discovered Ava's backstory and before we had some of the details about how her relationship with Matt would go it it before we knew that it just it felt a little bit like okay why are we writing this romantic comedy like what's going on here so I would say as far as struggle goes I would say like just getting started in the first half you know there were times uh when I was like so where's this going like what are, what are we gonna do yeah. um yeah so it took it took I don't know like a little bit of um patience I think to to have everything lock into place mm -hmm. that makes sense I mean, were there, were there particular characters? I mean, I just think that for any novelist, you just, you, what's working in a book is also what poses problems. I mean, in other words, you, it's a cul-de-sac that you're going to sort of find yourself in. You have to get out of that cul I mean, just on a sort of a nitty gritty, maybe I, I'm more interested in the nitty gritty than most, but um, yeah, were there any characters who were particularly difficult for you to get right? Or were there any, yeah, were there any narrative problems that, yeah, yeah like, I mean. Yeah, well, we, <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um, I think Matt was, our, I was gonna say. you're gonna say that? Yeah, I think Matt, we revised the most from beginning, to, from the beginning of the process to the end. Um, we, he started really as a caricature of like a tech bro, really, irritating tech bro he had I remember that we had his hair in a sort of swoop in the early <laughs> drafts like he had this like really shellacked hair and he had I, I can't we put him in different clothes yeah um, we, his di like his dialogue was really um kind of hard to read like it was just so he was just so bro -y. and he still is yeah but it was turned way up initially and I think that we realized that we needed in order for the suspense to work, we needed for the romance to work. And in order for the romance to work, he needed to be, we needed to just dial it back a little bit with him and make him actually appealing. And um, like somebody, somebody that um, she could potentially, end, that Ava could end up with. And, you right. know, I, there might be some disagreements over whether, <laughs> whether she would end up with a guy like this, but. Um, but I think we had to really 
fully believe in the romance between them in order for the rest of the book to work. And that was hard. Yeah. Yeah. I think we also turned her various neuroses like down a little bit. I think that she was a little bit harder to like in our earlier drafts. Um, Jaime, who we both love and we both loved writing, we realized, I think, in our sort of second big revision that we needed to give him like way more airtime. Um, yeah. Yeah. And kind of make make him sort of make him the like very good friend that that he is. And that kind of raises the stakes, I think. Mm -hmm. So like in some ways did the book become, and like in your own minds, less satirical as you, I mean, it sounds like you're saying a little bit like um, that it required, that, that to do what you needed to do narratively, it required a reorientation for how the two of you felt about Matt. Yeah. Somewhat less, somewhat less dramatically ironic in a later draft than in the early, is that, is that my understanding correctly? Yeah, I think so. so. We had to sort of fall for him, which was really yeah. difficult. You yeah, know, it was like, but I think that if if you don't buy into the romance, then you don't keep reading. And so we had to sort of like ignore the satire and ignore the what we you know we knew that there was suspense lurking, and we had to ignore that and really just focus on the romance between them and try to try to really make it authentic and alive. Yeah. And that was slightly difficult to do in, when we were still in the first half. I, I feel like I, I remember talking to Eve and, and saying like, well, shouldn't we be starting to take this apart now? And Eve was like, no, no, like be patient. We have to, <laughs> we have to buy into it. So, yeah. But it is interesting to hear um, readers reaction to the book. And some say that like we, we had dinners recently with somebody who said that she was like crying on the toilet reading it. <laughs> um, like, so it, I don't know, it hits some people you know some people say oh like what a hilarious book and some people say like what a sad book mm -hmm. and um yeah I'm glad that we hit all those notes yeah. and I, I don't think we had too much anxiety about it being all these different things at once I think that's actually kind of to the book's credit and exciting about it mm -hmm. yeah maybe you guys could talk a little bit more about Jaime who you just mentioned Laura um and I think about like you know Michael Cunningham talks about um you have to think of your most minor character as you, in your novel as a major character from another novel who is making a cameo appearance in your novel. I always think about that when I'm writing minor characters. But one thing that's interesting about Jaime is that he's neither, he's not a major character, but he's a lot more major than a minor character. <laughs> and I often think that these in-between kinds of characters are, are often hardest to draw. And I was curious if you had some thoughts about, I mean, Laura, you mentioned that, you know, you beefed him up in some way. I mean, one thing that struck me about him is he seems he seems very invested um, in in Ava's love choices, um, and I was interested, yeah, in your thoughts about him and in, in his investment. And um, yeah, I guess my, I'm leaving it as broad as possible. Like <laughs> his role in the book for you guys, since he is, he does take up a lot of real estate in an interesting way. Yeah, he's a really good friend to her and she's a really bad friend back to him, I would say, first of all. Like, yeah. she's not really the hero of the story, I would say he is. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, I think that one thing that we tried to develop um, during our revisions is this idea of him, like, missing missing Ava in a lot of ways and missing Andy. Ava's, I don't think this is a spoiler, like, ex who, who has died in a car accident and they used to be really close. And um, I think that, you know, in an earlier draft, we had him kind of being sort of like judgmental or skeptical about her decision to hang out with Matt, be with Matt. Um, and that felt a little bit like, it felt like just a little bit one note or something. Um, and so in revision, I think we like developed his sense of, of grief a little bit more. Yeah, he's lost this person too, who Ava has lost. Um, and he's lost Ava. I mean, Ava has sort of disappeared into this like black hole of grief. And I think he's he's tenacious and feels like he can get her back if if she stops dating this guy mm -hmm. <laughs> who has entered the picture. And he's 
you know, he's skeptical. He, Jaime is a character, you know, we, something we did in revision was make him um, sort of skeptical of everything. I mean, right. he's a bit paranoid. He's um, like, he thinks that tea bags have some ingredient in them that shouldn't go into hot water. And, you know, like he right. thinks that the Stata cleaning products are harmful and that there's, that the air is harmful. And he also thinks that Matt is harmful. Yeah. And so um, we, yeah, I think that, that was part of the revision, making him sort of like, not wacky, but a, a little bit of a tinfoil hat friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I think that helps sort of explain a little bit why he's um, so concerned with Matt. Yeah. Um, and I think that like developing his friendship with Ava a little bit, like for example, in the beginning of the book, we see some of the dating shows that they're watching together and we see a little bit more of their friendship. It was also kind of a way to get to see a softer, more comfortable side of Ava and to get to know her a little bit better and feel a little bit more warmth from her than you would have gotten otherwise. That's true. There's only, she has only Jaime and her dog or, you know, that's, yeah. Those are the only source, sources of warmth really in her life. Yeah. Um, yeah, and is it your sense? I mean, my sense is that um, that Ava, in her own grief, kind of forgot that Jaime was in grief too. Is that your sense of how she yeah, used to? Yeah, her? definitely. Yeah, he had his own relationship with Andy, you know, and she forgets that. I think she's really she's because she hasn't dealt with her her own grief and trauma. She's really self-obsessed and she thinks that she's the only one who's right. feeling this way and that like, you know, nobody else is suffering and right. Yeah. And she resists talking about it. And we find out kind of later that like he might have really liked to and that he's been, you know, kind of, I mean, I guess I don't want to give too much away, but he's been, um, yeah, he's been really missing her in that way. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I'm thinking back to the issue of collaboration. And of course, you know, even if you're, even if one's writing a book on one's own, the writing is always collaborative in the sense that you usually have some readers before the book comes to publication. And even if you don't have readers before you sell the book, your editor and sometimes your agent is a reader and um, sometimes gives suggestions. I'm just curious about that part of the process for the two of you. Um, were there suggestions that were made along the way that helped you think about the book differently than you would have thought without having had those readers? What, what, was, what was that experience of you know, getting from that initial draft to the book we have in our hands today? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I mean, for, for me, it was really helpful to hear what people were seeing in it. Um, like, I, I think that like, some of our earlier readers like mentioned that they were laughing when they were reading it. And I think it wasn't until that point that we knew that it was funny. And so it was just like nice to sort of see it reflected back at us in different interesting ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know that the feedback we got was to, was turning down Ava's neuroses a lot. Mm -hmm. She used to be much more, even more regimented and almost like, you know, on the spectrum a little bit, I think, than she is in the current iteration. And so we, I think we heard some feedback about toning, toning that down a little bit. Um, and then also making Jaime more important and, and giving more sort of making his character a little more robust instead of just having this friend who, I don't know, who seems to kind of like a mosquito or yeah, something. Yeah, he felt sort of pesty. Yeah. Um, and and so I think we, yeah, our agent really helped us there too, of like just giving a little more to his character, um, spending more time on his character. Um, and, but, you know, we were, it was very nerve wracking to show this book to people because we co-wrote it. And so that felt, you know, like I can remember um, being at um, like literary, conferences and workshops and and bringing up the fact that I was writing this book with a friend um and just sort of like the skeptical looks that I got you know I was like oh okay like how are your short stories going um, um and so we were I was pretty shy about sharing the book I don't you know like maybe we had um we showed some chapters to our 
to my um, MFA classmates, a few of them, but otherwise, you know, there were a couple, we had a couple readers, but really not many because I was like, what are we doing? You know, like, I don't know anybody who's done this. I don't know what this is. This could be a total failure. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, we, we really didn't know. And so it was a, it was a huge moment of validation when we um, started submitting the book and got, got interest from, from agents and, um, and Faye Bender was, is, has just been like, you know, so validating and, and, and Pilar, our editor, um, who like, I think that another really great thing that came out of feedback that we got, especially from Pilar was to really like draw the ending out a little bit more and just help with pacing. Um, so that was really helpful. Yeah. And now that it's out in the world. Yeah. Um, which is obviously very exciting and you guys both deserve huge congratulations for that. What's that? What's that been like? I mean, I don't mean like, does it make you happy? Does it make you depressed? I don't, I don't mean, I mean I, I, what I mean more is sort of, yeah, have there been surprises to you in terms of how people react to the book or, yeah. Do you think about the book differently than you did before it was public in some ways? I mean, I think it's, to, for me at least, it's been a really surreal, I mean, it's been a wonderful experience, but it's also been really surreal, um, you know, to have this thing that for so long was really just something between me and Eve, and then, you know, um, Faye and Pilar and our readers, but now it's, it's, it's out in the world and people who, hopefully people who don't know us are reading it. Um, and I mean, it feels like a very vulnerable experience. It's, What's been interesting for me is how many writers have um, said that they're interested in co-writing books. Like, you know, I was like, what? Nobody talked about this when we were actually writing the book. You know, like, yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's been interesting. And, and I would say that that's what we get asked about the most is the collaboration. And it seems like something that, I don't know, is actually really interesting for you know, that actually, that's been a really surprising part of this whole experience. When we were first um, going out with it, we were considering using a pen name. Um, I think that we, we felt like we weren't sure whether um, being different in this way would be a benefit to us and that it, maybe it would feel distracting or gimmicky or something to see two names, two names on the book. Um, and uh, our, our editor encouraged us to use our, our real names. And I'm, I'm so glad that we did. And I think I've been I felt really surprised by how much people want to talk about the collaboration, how much people are really interested in it. I think we were sort of trying to, to hide, hide that part of the process, which at this point seems um, kind of crazy. But I mean, even in writing the book, we were hiding the collaboration the entire time. Yes. Yeah. Um, to the point where we could have, I think, put one name on it and nobody would have, I don't think anybody would have noticed if we yeah, had come up with a pen name. So. Um, so yeah, but I, I think it has put some wind in our sails for writing writing another book where it's like, you know, this this worked out really nicely. And um, but I had no idea how people would find the book, whether they, you know, like I, I've been very pleasantly surprised by the by the reception, but especially from writers who um, you know, I, I just think that there's that um the idea of writing a novel is so intimidating and like lonely and you know there's just this image of loneliness and sadness and like suffering and um it was really um what's the word it was just great to to break through that <laughs> like to you know like try something different where the, the collaboration was so full of joy and um we we're constantly building something and it's funny because the book really makes fun of this what I'm talking about now it's like you know really skewers this kind of yes and man mentality but it really worked for us where yeah. there wasn't really room for feeling discouraged um and I don't intend to feel that way ever again when writing <laughs> like now that I've had a taste of it it's just like um it's wonderful yeah it was a really like fun and playful experience and I think that we put a lot of wind in each other's sails along the way and um yeah it was it More was people should receiving do it. receiving Eve's chapter was like the best part of my week <laughs> so I would stop what I was doing it was the best it was the best you know um content uh, you know the best thing I was reading at the time so 
Well, I mean, there's a lot more that I can ask, but I want to give um, the audience a chance to ask questions. So maybe Chelsea, you're going to jump on and okay. yeah. moderate it. Yeah. Great. Um, so we have a question here from Sanai Rashid, um, who says uh, they're 16 and want to be a journalist and novelist. And the very nice box was such a great read. I especially love the time spent on Ava's bisexuality since I haven't read many bi characters in literature until this novel. What is something you always keep in mind while creating queer characters? And what are some tips you have for mixing romance and thriller? You did it so wonderfully. Oh, oh thank you. So nice. um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was really important to us. I think we, we, we wanted to write a queer character um, and it was important to us to not make the story all about Kind of like queer struggle and and suffering that has to do with queerness specifically so um you know i think that ava is really sort of anxious about a lot of things in her life but her identity isn't one of them and that, that was the gift that we wanted to give her i think we didn't really want to put her under a microscope yeah she we we she went through a lot <laughs> and um it was nice to give her the freedom of like not worrying what it meant that she was attracted to Matt, for instance, when historically she had been with women. Right. And we didn't want her relationship with Matt to invalidate her past relationships with women. Um, and so, you know, writing her relationship with Andy, her ex was, I mean, those were some of my favorite parts of the, of the book to write. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I, we tried and I hope that we were able to kind of make both relationships feel feel true in the same in the same space. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a question here from Todd Green. Uh, you provided so much detail and depth for the startup products. Were there any real life Scandinavian furniture companies that provided inspiration for Stata? No, <laughs> that wasn't based on anybody at all. <laughs> you had a really good point about this recently, which is that like, the easy comparison is Ikea, you know, uh, but actually, I mean, I, I won't take take the wind from your sails, but I felt like it was more Muji. It's funny. Yeah. They, as a lover of Muji, the Japanese convenience store. Um, yeah, like I, I think the Stata products go beyond furniture. I know they do. They go beyond furniture. <laughs> there's clocks and there's um, pens and notebooks. And so um, and I would also just add that we both, we love Ikea and we love Muji and like, um, there was just a lot of joy to be had creating some sort of like child of these two companies. Yes. I would say that like the, you know, Ava's love of storage and the sort of like serenity that she feels when she sees storage containers fitting perfectly together is you know an experience that she and I share when I walk into a Muji and I see all of the like glowing plastic containers all stacked in a row I just feel like at peace. In fact um, Ava's name we sort of picked Ava's name because it looks geometrically nice you know with the sort of triangular and initially she was just called H and we picked H because we could sort of fold it in half and like it was like fold it in half yeah. both ways. And, <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, we, I think both find uh, some tranquility in this kind of thing. Uh, Marie Rutsky asks, could you talk a little bit about the origin for the Good Guys group? Yeah, Good Guys is um, sort of a like men's self-help group that Matt is part of. Um, and we, Basically, to, I don't know, like while we were writing this, I was listening to a lot of pop Buddhist podcasts and I thought these are great. I wish I could live my life this way all the time, <laughs> like in this Zen mode. But what would happen if it like fell into the hands of a, of like just a rotten egg? Yeah, um, it was really fun to imagine like what it would look like for a group of men to use a self-help framework to like inadvertently make themselves worse people yeah which is i don't know it's hard to talk about this part of the book because it um it might contain spoilers but it was it was really it was really fun to make also 
you know, there are these um, real life sort of men's self self help gurus like Jordan Peterson that I that we were looking towards. So like, what what are what are powerful men telling other men to do to feel better about themselves? Right. And, um, so yeah, those I think those self help books and those podcasts um, were the basis of Good Guys, which was probably I don't know a highlight for me to write. Yeah. Yeah. And Ashley Woodfolk would like to know, um, why did you decide to include the Vandals subplot? I'm so glad you yeah, asked about that. This is the first ever question we've received about the Vandals. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to, I, for me, I think that um, I, we wanted to show that companies like Stata wouldn't exist, don't exist in a vacuum, um, despite the fact that, oh, um, got a cat, sorry they their employees may be super insulated from the communities where the headquarters are located um so part of it was like not wanting to show stata existing in a vacuum where everything that stata does is just sort of taken as a given um and also part of it was just like it was really fun to imagine like a, a plucky tech savvy group of gen zers like pretty easily infiltrating this company that feels otherwise like totally impenetrable and it was just really fun fun to write yeah it was really fun to write their their antics and i think actually we took them more seriously as we wrote the book and you know like as we got into revisions initially the the vandals were doing sort of these sort of you know like like they were just gluing dollar bills to the parking lot and they were kind of like annoying analog nuisance type stuff yeah like skateboarding in the wrong places yeah. and i think as we revised the novel we we started to take them more seriously and i think they sort of help with showing how um showing some of ava's flaws because she has shut up she doesn't she's so apathetic about these these um quote-unquote vandals who are actually like you know they're 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 protesters and they're they're trying to make you know they're trying to um they're there to stop this giant building from being erected in place of like a community garden and she just ignores them and um you know and and many employees do like at stata they're just like oh this, these guys are a nuisance and i think when we first started writing the book we sort of felt that way too. And, and over the course of revising, we felt like these people need to like get under Ava's skin and sort of like shine a light on, on the ways that she's not just a bad friend, but kind of a bad ally and yeah. um, totally divorced from, from the world around her because she's so obsessed with her grief, even, even though she wants to get as far away from it as possible. It's like inhibiting her from actually connecting with the world around her and the issues that are that she's contributing to. We have time for one more question here uh, from Robin Carroll, uh, who asked, do you have more affinity for companies like Stata after being immersed in it or the opposite? <laughs> more what? More empathy? Was that the question? Affinity. Oh, affinity. <sighs> I mean, one thing that we really wanted to do was like, Stata, Stata is sort of like one of these contemporary workspaces that is like nicer than any hotel you could ever stay in. Um, and the, the environment is so appealing. You're getting breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we wanted to show sort of like how fine the line is between like appealing and totally unappealing. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think that like Stata is totally over the top and it's a place that I want to be it feels comfortable um right you wouldn't turn down the like fruity wellness water right um but no i'm not like i i am always going to be happy to walk into an ikea even though apparently laura just told me this that when you check out of an ikea there's like a piercing sound that plays yeah no that, loitering that is to keep away loiterers from ikea yeah and that is like i can't get over that I'm against that policy, <laughs> but no, we're fans. Thank you uh, so much, Eve and Laura and Joshua for tonight's fantastic conversation. And thank all of you for coming out tonight and spending this time with us. 
uh, a reminder that you can buy the very nice box from Greenlight and you can get signed copies while supplies last. Uh, I am pasting that book buy link in the chat. If you buy online, just be sure to request a signed copy and order comments at checkout. Or you, if you're um, local here to Brooklyn, you can stop by the stores and find some signed copies. Thank you so much again, Eva, Laura, and Joshua for a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you, Josh. You. This is a great book. Really enjoyed talking to you all. Yeah, likewise. Have a great night, everyone. You too. All right.